there is life in Africa. <laughs> Shall we be seated? You know, when we were singing the English songs, I almost fell asleep. <laughs> and then I was like, where is Africa? And suddenly we got there. Praise the Lord. Yeah. I almost joined the dancing, but my shoes would have flipped off. <laughs> so I didn't want to take the risk. It is a pleasure and a huge privilege to be here today. And I want to thank my dear friend and brother, the Vice Chancellor. He is such a persistent and perseverant, he never gives up. He's been chasing me, John, you have to come. And I give him excuse after excuse, and all the excuses got finished this time. <laughs> and so I'm here, and I'm so glad to be here. God bless you all. I come from Ghana, and I'm going to be speaking to you, and I know that the accent is not going to be usual to you as you are used to. I studied in the UK, and we had students from all over the world. And one of the evenings, we had a Korean student who invited us for dinner. So we went for the meal. She cooked a wonderful Korean dish. We ate, we enjoyed it, and then she came out and she asked us, did you like the food? And we said, sure, we loved it. She said, did you like the meat? We said, wonderful. It was the tastiest meat we've ever eaten. <laughs> and then one of us asked her, what meat is that? And she said, duck. <laughs> and when she said duck, some of the students started running to the bathroom and started vomiting and vomiting. And she was shocked. She's like, what is happening? And they said, you said you gave us dog meat. She said, no, 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 no. Quack, 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 quack. Duck. <laughs> So if you hear me say, dog, please don't vomit yet. <laughs> don't throw out. It may be quack, quack, and not woof, woof. <laughs> I come from northern Ghana, which is Islamic. I come from Muslim background. And I'm here to share with you about my passion and my heart for the Islamic world and for the Muslim world. I am an evangelist. I'm a teacher, but above all, I love my people. Amen. Amen. So I talk about, I talk to you this week on Islam and on Christian missions. As a mission field that we need to know, that we need to engage, that we cannot run away from, because it is a very important mission field. So knowing the field, it's absolutely essential if we have to do ministry, if we have to do missions in the world in which we live today. And I just want to give you a quick, the first half, I want to give you some information about Islam as a missionary religion. And then the second half, I will just highlight what we as Christians can do and should do as Christians who are preparing for missions and for ministry in our world today. There are 1.6 billion Muslims in the world that we are talking about. 1.6 billion. Making about 26% of the world population. By 2030, Muslims will make about 26% of the world's population. So it's a huge mission field that we're talking about. In Asia alone, the world Muslim population, 62% live in Asia. 
So the majority of Muslims are not in the Middle East. 62% of Muslims are Asians. They live in Asia, Pacific. The Middle East has only about 20%. Only about 20% that we're talking about. And so when you hear of Islam, immediately you think about the Middle East. You think about Arabs. But 80% of Muslims today are not Arabic speaking. 80%. In sub-Saharan Africa, we have about 15% of the world Muslim population in sub-Saharan Africa. 15%, one five. And so this is a huge mission field. This is a huge area that the church cannot run away from. It's an area that the church cannot close our eyes to. In Europe, 2.7% of Muslims live in Europe. But Europe includes Russia. It includes the former Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, and Western Europe combined. The Americas is about 0.3% of Muslims live there in the world. And the world's Muslim population is expected to increase by about 35% in the next 20 years. About 35%. Muslims are the fastest growing religious community in the world. Not by conversion, but by birth. By birth rate. And so, we need to be aware of that. I talked about this in Nigeria, and a Nigerian pastor said to me, you people should give us the chance so that we can compete with the Muslims. Because they can marry four wives, and we can only marry one wife. <laughs> I am not going to advocate that here. But we need to be aware that we have to, this is a mission field we have to engage. It's the fastest glow, growing kind of demographics that we have across the world. In Uganda, there are about between 12 and 15 percent of Ugandan population is Muslim, depending on which statistics you are looking at, 12 and 15 percent. And so you, we cannot ignore about six to seven million Muslims in our midst. We need to know who our neighbors are and what it is and how is it that we can engage our neighbors. This is a huge society, part of our society. And so the first part I want to give you, just a quick recap that some of you might know already, and therefore I don't want to dwell upon that. What do these 1.6 billion people believe in? What is it that they believe in? In Islam, we have what we call the beliefs, and we have what we call the pillars. You believe, and you practice. You have belief, but you have a duty that you've got to perform. So your belief, your faith is good, but it's not good enough without your duties. Faith comes with duties. In Christianity, we say that we are saved by grace through faith. We are saved by grace through faith. In Islam, we are saved by faith through duties or through works. We are saved by faith through works. You cannot just believe. You've got to act it out. You've got to demonstrate it. You've got to live it. And so, the beliefs, the articles of faith. Belief in God is the first belief. God is one. Allahu Wahid. God is one in Islam. God is one. God is not Trinity. Who will come to that? Belief in angels. Muslims believe in angels. God has messengers. And these messengers are angels, first and foremost. There are a lot of talk about angels in Christian scriptures. So Christians share this belief with Muslims. We believe in angels also. There are different angels with different functions, different responsibilities. Apart from the angels, there are prophets who are also messengers of God. So believe in prophets. Jesus is a prophet in Islam. Muhammad is the final prophet. Jesus is the John the Baptist in Islam who came to prepare the way for the final prophet who is Muhammad. <laughs> and so we've got to be aware of that. That Jesus in Islamic teaching came to prepare the way and to announce the coming of the final prophet. So the belief in prophets, very strong in Islam. Belief in scriptures. 
Muslims believe that prophets came with scriptures, with books, holy books. So each prophet was given a holy book. Most of these holy books have been lost or corrupted. Only four, four have survived. The four is the Torah given to Moses, the Psalms given to David, the Gospel or the Angel given to Jesus, and finally, of course, you should know the last one, the Quran <laughs> given to Muhammad. So these are the four scriptures. So I believe in four scriptures. The Torah, the Psalms, the Gospel, and the Quran. Now, the Quran is the perfect of all of these four. The Quran is the perfect, according to Muslim teaching. All the others have been corrupted. And therefore, the Quran is here to replace that and to correct that. And if you like, improve upon those ones. But these scriptures come from the same source. But for the corruption, they teach the same thing. Belief in the last days. Belief in the last days. Very important belief. In the last days, God is going to call all of us, and God is going to judge us. And you know, the judgment is going to be very simple. There's not going to be any long talk. You come, you appear before God, and you've got your deeds. God has got a record of your deeds. The good deeds, record will be given to you in your left hand. The bad deeds will be given to you in your left hand. And the good deeds will be given to you in your right hand. And then you approach a scale and you place your deeds on the scale and you can guess. <laughs> if your bad deeds outweigh your good deeds, there's only one way. If your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, then you are the luckiest person. There's only one way. And so it's simple. It's about your deeds. And so you've got to make sure that you check your account on a daily basis. Make sure that the good deeds are away in the bad deeds. So that when you appear there, then you can stand a chance of salvation. But then, so these are the five official beliefs. Five beliefs, official beliefs. But there's always a sixth one, which is not official, but also important. Predestination. Predestination in Islam is a very important belief. God has decreed everything in our lives. We are here today. Listening to this speech today, because before the creation of the earth, God had decreed that this day, this time, this hour, you and I are going to be here talking about this issue. God decreed everything. So you've got this five official beliefs and the six beliefs. These are the beliefs that Muslims have to, be, have to hold on to. But then the duties, the duties are the pillars in Islam. The duties, the shahada, or the witness. You don't just believe, you confess it. You must witness to it. You must bear witness to what you believe. La ilaha illallah wa Muhammad Rasulullah. You believe that. You have to say it. You have to say it. You have to declare it. That is the belief. You don't just harbor it in your head. The salat, or the prayer, five times a day, facing Mecca, you've got to say it. You've got to say five times a day. You perform it in a particular way. Saying the prayer has to be in the Arabic language. That's your, that is the teaching. It has to be in the Arabic language. Then you have the fasting, the Ramadan, which we have gone through already. The Ramadan. This month. One month of fasting. And then the zakat or alms giving. You give alms to help the poor and the needy. The zakat is given to poor Muslim and needy Muslims. Then you have the, the hajj or the pilgrimage, which you have to perform once in your lifetime. These are the five official beliefs, uh, du duties, that you, you have to perform. But then, there's a sixth one, which is not also official, but very important also, and that is jihad, or struggle. Struggle. It's a, a sixth pillar, a sixth pillar which is very important, and the struggle has three dimensions. You struggle against your inner selfish inclinations, you struggle by speaking out against evil, and you struggle by physically stopping evil where you see it. So that you have this as your duties. When you, there's evil in you, you struggle within you to stop it. When you see evil around you, first of all, speak out against it. Speak out against it. And then the third level is stop it physically. If need be, by force, stop it. That is a physical jihad. So these are the pillars. 
and the, 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 the duties and the beliefs in Islam. Now, I want to talk this week about what I call the five phases of Islam. The five phases of Islam is different from the different Islamic groups. The, uh, today, I'm going to talk about the missionary phase or Islamic da'wah. The phase of Islam that is missionary, that we need to know as Christians. Muslims are, is, Islam is a missionary religion. Muslims are to call to the straight path. Islam is the straight path. Sirat al the straight path. That's the, that's the faith, the belief. Christianity talks about the narrow way. Islam talks about the straight way or the straight path. And then we have the mystical faith or the Sufi Islam. The Sufi Islam, the mystical Islam, the spiritual Islam that we see around us that performs all kinds of beliefs in spiritual matters, in, in the supernatural and takes dreams and visions seriously. Then we talk about the ideological phase or the political phase of Islam. That emphasizes the Islamic state and Islamic law. We're going to look at that. And how should we as Christians respond to that? Then we'll look at the militant phase, the physical struggle in the power of Allah for the sake of to establish an Islamic governance. This is what we are going to be looking at also. And then the progressive phase, the critical phase that, that re seeks to reread the Quran and traditions and calls for reformation in Islam. This, so there are five phases of Islam that I want to explore with you this week. That we, as Christians, how do we respond to these different manifestations of Islam? Islam is not monolithic. It's not one. Muslims disagree, just like Christians do. These phases cut across all the different sects in Islam. And these phases are not compartmentalized. You have missionaries who are ideological, you have militants who are ideological, you have Sufis who are missionary. So it kind of, it's a kind of over, overlapping circles. And above all, most of these groups, they don't like each other. They don't get along. They don't get along. And so these are the phases that we are going to be looking at this week. So Islamic missions or Islamic da'wah. Islam talks about summons. Da'wah means summons or invitation. Invitation to the path of God, to the straight path. Invite to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them in ways that are best and most gracious. For the Lord thy God, for, the, for thy Lord knows best who have strayed from his path and who receive guidance. Someone invite to the way of thy Lord. Invitation. That why it's about invitation. So let there arise out of you, a band of people inviting all to good, enjoying what is right and forbidding what is wrong. They are the ones that attain felicity from the Quran. These are the verses that talk about Muslims going out to do mission work, to do da'wah. Just like we have in our scriptures also, to go out and be witnesses, to go out and evangelize the world, starting from Jerusalem to Judea and to the rest of the world. Muslims also have their own command to go out and, 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 and to do missions. In theory, Islam has no professional class of missionaries. Dawah is an obligation on all believers. Every Muslim is a missionary. When the VC was speaking, he talked about Christians seeing themselves everywhere they are as being in ministry. You know, sometimes we have made Christian missions so professional that people think that Unless I go to do professional studies in missions, I cannot be a missionary. I cannot do ministry. That is a wrong impression. In Islam, missionary work is not a professional job. Everybody is a missionary. Of course, they have started imitating Christians, and they also have missionaries now, a days. The Quran and other faiths, they preach from the Quran. So what does the Quran say about other faiths that Muslims preach about? To each among you we prescribe a law, an open path, an open way. If Allah had so willed, he would have made you a single people. But his plan is to test you in what he had given to you. So strive as a race in all virtues. To each among you Allah has prescribed a way, an open way. In other words, there are different religions, different paths. That's one thing the Quran says. There are different paths, different religions. It admits that. In other words, Follow your religion, I will follow my religion. But then there are those that, 
Those who believe in the Quran and those who follow the Jewish scripture and the Christians and the Serbians who believe in Allah and, and the last day and work righteousness shall have their reward with their Lord. In other words, if you're a Christian or a Jew or a Muslim, you will be saved. These two religions are all sal have salvific value in them. You will be saved. So the Quran has these positive things to say about other religions. But then, the Quran has specific things to say about Christianity. You see. Oh, people of the book, commit no excesses in your religion. No say of Allah aught but the truth. Jesus, Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, was no more than a messenger of Allah and his word, which he bestowed on Mary and the spirit proceeding from him. So believe in Allah and his messengers. Say not Trinity. This is, it will be better for you. A, a clear declaration. Don't say Trinity. Trinity is wrong. God is one. The Quran is clear. So that you find in the Quran teaching that criticizes Christianity very strongly and condemns Christianity. So Muslim preachers, these are the things that they use to attack Christian teaching and Christian beliefs. And we need to know as Christians what the teaching is about our faith if we want to engage with Muslims who are our neighbors and our friends and our classmates in any conversation. Islam is the straight path. Islam is the way. In all of this, the Quran also talks about the fact that the religion before Allah is Islam. In other words, no other religion will God accept except Islam. No other religion. Allah accepts only Islam. So you and I, we need to be careful because on that day, we are not going to be accepted. <laughs> That's the teaching. You see. So when we think that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father but by me, this is what Muslims say. No, 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 no. Allah accepts only Islam, not Christianity. You see. If anyone desires a religion other than Islam, never will it be accepted of him. If anyone desires a religion other than Islam, it will not be accepted of them. In other words, Muslims have a duty to convert the whole world because they believe very passionately, very strongly, that Islam is the only religion. It's the only true religion. Muslims don't apologize for that. I teach in, 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 in the West, and I see Christians apologizing for Christianity. And I'm like, no! In my country, Muslims and Christians, we don't apologize for our religion. We preach it, we share it, and we compete to want to convince each other that ours is the true religion. We don't apologize because Muslims don't apologize for being, for having the true religion. And we as Christians should not be apologizing. We should have the same confidence, if not even more, about our religions also and about our traditions. Islamic dawah, Islamic missions, it started from the beginning with few isolated exceptions. Muslims were more interested in commerce and in conquest, not in converts. In the beginning, Muslims didn't take these things seriously. They were out to trade and in some places to conquer. They were not interested in converts. You see. But then, Muslims started learning from Christian missionaries from the 19th and 20th century, when Christians started going out with missionaries in the Muslim world to preach and to convert Muslims, Muslims started organizing also to send missionaries also out to respond to Christian missionaries. And therefore, missionary activities in the Muslim world started as a response to Christian missions, very, very clearly. And Saudi Arabia has been leading the forefront in Muslim missions because Muslim Islamic da'wah because Saudi Arabia has been blessed with oil and they've had the money. And since the 1980s, Saudi has been at the forefront. There is a very strong budget for missions, for da'wah, state-sponsored da'wah, funded mass distribution of Islamic literature around the world. And you find Islamic literature everywhere, given free, given freely. Mass distribution of the Quran you find the Qur'an sent out freely to many parts of the world. Africa especially. A lot of Qur'ans sent out millions for free. So it's about mission, it's about dawah. And they give scholarships. 
for young Muslims to go and study in the Islamic countries. In Saudi Arabia, in the Gulf countries, in Egypt, in Libya, you find a lot of mission scholarships given to Ugandan Muslims, to Ghanaian Muslims, to Nigerian Muslims, and they go and study, and they come back as missionaries. So missions is very well organized in the Islamic countries by the Islamic governments. And also the building of mosques is one missionary strategy. You come to Africa, you come to Ghana, and you find many Christians worshiping under trees. They have no buildings to worship, and I believe in Uganda, it's the same challenge. And yet, you come to the village, there are only three Muslims or two Muslims, and there's a beautiful mosque that is standing there. And you're like, where are the worshippers? But it is a statement of dawah that has been made. It's a statement that this territory, we are claiming it for our religion. We are claiming it. And therefore, over time, you see that they begin to make progress in those kinds of areas. So Islamic Dawah is also comprises building of mosques around in strategic areas also. They buy land in strategic areas and build a mosque. It is a statement of faith that this is our territory. This is our land and we are here to stay. And we need to also be aware of that and, and take that seriously. One of the missionaries who has been very, very productive if I may put it that way, in Africa, is Ahmed Didat. Some of us here know Ahmed Didat by name. He died in 2005. A South African Muslim. He has converted many more Christians to Islam than any single Muslim missionary has done. And Ahmed Didat did that through preaching and through writing of scriptures, of, of, of texts against Christianity. A lot of polemical material against Christianity is distributed freely. Again, Saudi government have printed this literature and is distributed freely across the Muslim world in different languages. In different languages. And so Ahmed Didat has had the support, a lot of financial backing to do his missionary work around the world. Since the 80s and the 90s, he has been debating Christian scholars and Christian missionaries. He's actually, as I said, passed away in 20. Oh, five. But the work continues. The work continues. So how do we respond? How do we respond as Christians? This is what St. Francis of Assisi back in the 12th century and the 13th century did or said. At that time, there was a lot of fear of Islam like we have today. In the 13th, 12th, 13th century, Christians were fighting Muslims. Christians were sending their soldiers to go and fight the Muslims in the crusade. And Francis of Assisi said, we should not be sending bombs. We should not be sending soldiers to go and kill Muslims. We should be sending preachers with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So St. Francis said, instead of sending bombs, I am going to send missionaries. I am going to send the Bible. I am going to send the gospel. So he started sending, preparing missionaries and send them to the Muslim world. He himself went to the Muslim world. He went to Egypt to try to convert the Sultan. He didn't succeed, but at least he made the attempt. <laughs> he talked about the witness of life. That he's sending these people as sheep among wolves. He knows the dangers. He knows the risk. But he says, we have no option. We have no choice. We have to still go. Mission work it's not something comfortable. It's not a bed of roses. There are challenges, but we still have to go. And he said, I'm sending you out as wolves, as sheep amongst wolves. And he says, when you go, and use words only when necessary. Let your life speak. Action speaks louder than words. Use words only when necessary. So the preaching on the street, he says, it should be the last resort. Just go and let your life, your presence be a witness in Muslim lands. The presence, the witness of presence. Just to be there and let them see you. You know, 27% of Muslim converts are drawn to the faith by coming into contact with Christians who impacted their lives. 
Not because they have preached to them, but 27% of Muslims who come to faith, they say it's the Christian life that challenged them, that made them to think, to question their own faith, and to begin the journey of becoming a Christian. So just your presence alone is a witness. It's a powerful witness. And that's what the VC was saying. If we are Christians and we take that seriously, and 85% are turned off Islam or Christianity because of Christians also. 85% of Muslims who don't want to become Christians is because of what some Christian has said to them or has done to them. 85%. And that's the challenge that you and I have. What is it that we are doing in our presence, in our witness, with our lives that is turning off people? And what can we do to make people interested in the gospel of Jesus Christ? This is what William Barclay had to say. William Barclay is one of my favorite commentators of, and, 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 and devotional writers of the last century. He says, more people have been brought into the church by the kindness of real Christian love than by all the theological arguments in the world. More people have been brought to the faith by kindness than by arguments, all in the world put together. And more people have been driven from the church by the hardness and ugliness of so-called Christians than by all the doubts in the world. You know, we can go out and argue and make Christianity look sensible, look rational, but if the Christian lifestyle does not match it, it is a waste of time. This is a waste of time. And so people want to see, they want to touch, they want to feel the gospel and not only just hear the gospel. So this is the challenge that we have. That we can argue with Muslims, we can do all of that, but our lifestyle should be the most powerful weapon. Our lifestyle. We have a mandate in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the world, of the earth. You will be my witnesses. I tell Christians, when the Bible says that you will be my witness, the Bible means it. You will be my witness. The Bible calls us to be witnesses. Not to be advocates. Not to be lawyers. Advocates are those who argue the cases. And they debate the cases. And they seek to win the cases by argument. Witnesses simply come to share what they have seen, what they have heard, or what they know. A witness is there to tell a story. And if you have a story to tell, you are the most qualified witness. Amen. We are not salesmen or saleswomen. We are not advocates. We are not judges. We are witnesses. You know, in a courtroom scenario, you have a judge, you have the accused and the accuser, you have the advocates or the lawyers who debate the cases, and you have the witnesses who are called to testify. You are not called to be the judge. The judge is to pass judgment and to sentence. The lawyer is called to argue and debate according to the laws and to seek conviction. You are not the lawyer. The Bible says you and I are the witnesses. We are those who are called to bear witness. And you know, we come to bear witness not only with our mouths and our words, but as I said, with our lifestyles. With our lifestyles. You know, in a court case, you may think that the witness is the easiest job. It is the trickiest job, actually. Because if the lawyer is smart, they will seek to undermine the witness. And when the lawyer is successfully undermines the witness, that case will do what? It will collapse. So when the witness life is undermined, your testimony is undermined, you have no case. You have no leg to stand. So being a witness is a very important task. We are in partnership with God and God's Holy Spirit and God's Son in mission. And most often, we are those who are the weakest link in this mission chain. We are the weakest link because our lifestyles don't match our, our message. 
And so people are not becoming Christians, not because the gospel is deficient, not because the gospel doesn't make sense, but the Christian lifestyle just doesn't add up. Christians are called to be living epistles. We are living epistles, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3, 2. We are called to make, the, to, to make the Jesus story our story. We are ambassadors of Christ. Make the Jesus story our story. It's not Jesus' story we are telling. We are also telling our story. And that is very important. The testimony of the blind man in John chapter 9. I love that story. I love the story of the, of, of the testimony of the blind man, the blind man who was healed in John chapter 9. You know, the religious leaders wanted to argue with him. He, he was blind and he was healed. And they called him. They said, they called his parents first. Uh, is this your son? Who you say was blind and now can see? Can you testify to that? And the parents, smart as they are, they don't want trouble. No, their child is now of age. They can speak for themselves. <laughs> and so they call this guy in. And they say, you tell us. Were you really blind? That now you can see? Look, look at the question. You know me. I, I sit here every day. You know it. I was blind. But now I can see. And they're like, what happened? Who did it? He said, Jesus. Jesus came. He spat in on my, put mud in my eyes. I said, I should go and worship. And I'm, I can see now. Like, What? Jesus is a liar. Jesus is a devil. Jesus is not a prophet. He is not a good man. What can you say that? I don't know. I don't know any of these arguments. All I know is my story. Amen. So you can go, you can debate that. You can argue with that. What I know and what you know is that I was blind. I was sitting here. And what you know, and what I know now, is that I can see. That is all I know. <laughs> you know, they could not argue with that. And so they kept diverting the story. No, 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 no. But, 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 he said, there is no but and ifs in this matter now. <laughs> Let's stick to my story. If you have a story, you don't need to debate with anyone. Amen. <laughs> stick to your story. Tell your story. They will debate. They will, and you know, if you read that story, they will kick the guy out. And then they will remain. And they will call him back again. Oh, what did you really say? They wanted to hear more, but they could not bear to hear it. If you have a story, if you have a witness, people will want to hear it. So the story of the blind man is a very powerful story. Witness is about persuasion. It's like courtship or dating. It's about friendship. You know, I tell my students in Ghana when I was teaching in Ghana that, you see, if you want to court a girl to marry, you've got to be very smart. You see, and the dumbest thing, the dumbest thing to do if you're courting a girl to marry is to go to them and start arguing with them. You see, that's the dumbest thing to do. You don't go out courting a girl to marry and start telling the girl, hey, Look at me. You see? Look at my family. We have a wonderful house. Look at your house. Look at how your dad is. See? What has he got for you? Look at your mom. What have they got for you? You come to my house, hey, it will be great. You see? How many girls will you marry with that kind of argument? <laughs> so, it's about witness is courtship. You don't go attacking the person's family. You don't go attacking what is close to them, what is dear to them. So I tell Christians, if you think you are going to convert Muslims by attacking Muhammad, by attacking the Quran, it will misfire. You don't go attacking what is closer to them. That is not their best approach. It's about witness. It's about friendship. It's about friendship. And you know what? Friendship you don't need a PhD degree 
to make friends. Amen. <laughs> you don't need a master's degree to, make, to learn how to make friends. Unless the VC is going to start a course on friendship. <laughs> a, a degree. We have to do a degree in friendship. We don't need a degree, do we? Anyone from the little child to the oldest person can make friends. It's about friendship. Jesus said, I no longer call you what? Servants. But now I call you what? Friends. The Christian witness is about making friends. And you can make friends with Muslims wherever you are. Be it on campus, be it in the workplace, be it in wherever you find, you can make friends. It's about friendship. And so, no one should live here with an excuse. I don't know Islamic theology, so I don't know how to witness to Muslims. Just go and be a friend. Amen. Amen. You know, this is one of the leading Islamic scholars in the world who said this. He said, missionaries made it their duty to attack and break down the Islamic religious system. And their method was, de was developed accordingly. They sought to prove to the Muslim by argument and controversy that Christianity was better. They failed, for they were fighting on the Muslim's ground. When you go to debate with Muslims, sometimes it's just futile. They say, well, the Quran says Jesus is not God. The Quran says the Trinity is wrong. The Quran says Jesus did not die on the cross. And then you come, you say, but, but the Bible, no, no, it's not about the Bible. It is about the Quran. <laughs> and when the Quran says it, it's final. You don't repeat it. You, you, you get a point. The Quran says, period. So you don't go arguing on those things. You, don't, you stand a little chance of winning that argument. And by the way, we are not sent out as witnesses to go and win arguments. We are sent out as witnesses to go and win souls for Jesus Christ. Amen. You have to go and win souls, not arguments. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Let your light shine. We are called to be light. And you know the Bible talks about the metaphors and the images the Bible uses is a lamp. We are a lantern, a lamp. You know there's a lamp and there's a torch light. Okay? How, you call torch light here too? Or flashlight. Touch. There's a lamp and there's a touch. And there's a big difference between the two. Jesus says, you are a lamp. You are a lantern. And you know what? When you are holding a, lamp, a, a, a torch and you enter into a room with people in darkness and you enter with your torch and you flash your torch into their faces, what will they normally do? They will shut out. You blind them. And that is what many Christians are good at. We use the gospel as a torch. We go flashing it into people's eyes and they're like... Whoosh, whoosh. <laughs> and you know, when you enter a room with a torchlight, you see them, they don't what? See you. That's a good disguise. You see them, they don't see you. Because it's easier that way. It's much more convenient that you go and expose them. Of, you expose them for their sins and their squalor and their evil deeds. And then yours is all hidden, you see. Because they don't see yours. But when you enter a room with a lantern, who is the one seen first? You are the one that they see first. Amen. And Jesus says, you are a lamp. You are a lantern. You are not a torch. You are a lantern. That's what Jesus, that was Jesus' ministry. And you know what? When you enter, when you make friends, and just be 
in the presence of people in their lives. And your Christian life begins to radiate, begins to shine. They will begin to see the mess around them. They themselves will see it. You wouldn't need to point it out to them. When you are a good Christian and you live with people, uh, you, some of you can testify that you, you had friends before you became a Christian. And since you became a Christian, you have become an inconvenience to your friends. When they are going some places, they will not invite you any longer. A lie. It will be true. Be, that's what Nigeria will say. It will be true. It will be true now. When they are drinking alcohol and they see you come and they start doing what? They start hiding. You have become an inconvenience. Your light begins to expose them. You don't even need to come and attack them. You just need to show up and they will start cleaning the mess in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Show up. As a lantern. Not as a torch. And again, the Bible says we are light. The Bible doesn't say we are fire. <laughs> Praise the Lord. There's a difference between light and what? And fire. Many Christians in Ghana, you see, maybe Ugandan Christians are different. We are fire. And we talk about, we are on fire for the Lord. We are on fire. And I'm like, whoa, I want a place to hide my head. Because when fire is coming, you better what? Run for your life. How many Christians have, have become fire? We go burn and everything in our path. And we think we are doing mission work. We are doing witnesses. No. We are called to be light. You know, when I, I went to study in Birmingham in the UK in the 90s, and then I went back to Ghana, and then I started teaching at the seminary. And some of the students who knew me before I went to the UK, they came to me and they talked, they said, Dr. Zuma, what has become of you? Before you went to the UK, you were on fire for the Lord. You were on fire. It looks like the fire has... <laughs> what, what, what has happened to the fire? And, and I'm like, maybe it's just the snow in Britain, I don't know. It's... it's <laughs> It's the winter that has put out the fire. You see, but I said to them, I said to that student in the class, I said, thank God that you don't see the fire any longer. I said, praise God. I said, you know what? The fire is all gone. What I hope is left is the light, which is just shining. Amen. So we are called to, to be light, to shine. We are not called to be fire, to burn. Stop burning and start shining for Jesus. Amen. Amen. But finally, what I want to say is that in our response to Islamic da'wah, Islamic mission, we have to commend Jesus. Learn, it's not about us. We sang that song. It's not about what? It's not about me. It's about Jesus. We have to start commending Jesus. 35% of converts who come to Christ and testify of, to the role of the figure of Jesus in their conversion. Muslims believe in dreams and visions. And I know countless Muslims who have become Christian because they had a vision. Because they had a dream of Jesus. Commend Jesus. Not about you. Not doctrine. Don't go argue about doctrines. As I said earlier, simply go and commend Jesus. You know, in, in the UK, I was studying in the University of Birmingham, and we had Muslim students and Christian students. We had Muslim professors and Christian professors. And we were studying together. And there was this particular Pakistani Muslim lady who took particular interest in converting me. Because... She got to know that I was a Muslim before I became a Christian. And she didn't like that. So she was trying every bit to convert me, to, to revert me, as she would say. And then she would invite me out for lunch, for meals. We were studying Arabic together. And then one day she invited me home. 
to have a meal, to know her family, and to have a meal with, with, the, with the husband and the children. And I was very glad I went home with her, and the husband had, was late in coming home. So she, we got home, and she said, John, just relax in the living room. I'm going to the kitchen to get the food ready. My husband will be here in a minute. But before then, not to leave you bored, I want to put a DVD on, a video on for you to watch. So she put on a video. And the video was about a Canadian Catholic priest who had become a Muslim. So the video was all talking about in the video, this guy was talking about how the Bible is full of errors and full of inconsistencies and that the ark of Noah is a myth. It never happened. Archaeologists have proven it. Science has proven it. The ark of Noah never happened. It's all a lie. So this woman subjected me to that. And for about 40 minutes, she re-emerges. She appears. Oh, John, how did you find that? How did you find the... And I had, I was fed up with it already. <laughs> so I just said to her, it's rubbish. And she was like, what do you mean? What do you mean? This, this is a Catholic priest. She knows the, he knows the Bible very well. He was trained. He's seen the light. He's become a Muslim. And you say it's rubbish? I'm like, she was called Amra. I said, Amra, you know what? My faith is not in the Ark of Noah. My faith is in a guy called Jesus Christ. Said, and no one can disprove Jesus. I said, if you can bring someone to me who can disprove Jesus in my life, then we will consider that. But as for the Ark of Noah, that is not of my business. She was very, very disappointed. We still had a meal, but it wasn't the most delightful of meals. <laughs> Come in, Jesus. Come in, Jesus. You see, the person of Jesus is a powerful attraction to Muslims. Jesus, as a friend of the sick, as those on the margins, the fringes, and the edges, not a set of dogmas. You know, most of us, our theologians, we have trained in the West. And so our minds is all tuned and to think the way Westerners think. It's about arguments. It's about rationalizing things. It's about explaining things to make sense. And all of that is very important. But you know, religion is more than arguments. Religion is more than dogmas. It's more than dogmas. It's more than rationalizing. You, don't, you can't explain everything. What many Muslims want to know is Jesus, who is the friend of the poor? The Jesus who heals the sick. That's what they want to know. And if we can commend that. You see, but finally, I said to people, pray for Muslims. That Jesus will meet them at their point of need. Be it through dreams or healing. Pray for Muslims. I said earlier, you have no excuse because anyone and everyone can make friends. For me, my passion and my mission is to make Christian missions and Christian ministry as unprofessional as possible. You don't have to be a professional to be in ministry, to be a witness. Anyone and everyone can be a witness. Yes, we need a professional to teach us, to equip us, to encourage us. But every one of us should be a foot soldier of Jesus and for Jesus. And if you cannot go, if you cannot become a missionary, like the VC was saying, if you cannot go into ordained ministry, one thing that you can do is to pray for Muslims. Everyone can pray. You know, in the Islamic countries, you cannot get visa to go and do missions. You cannot get visa to go and do that. But you know, we read of stories of Muslims who are converted in many Muslim countries. Because Jesus is there. Jesus goes there. Jesus meets them. Jesus convicts them. Jesus converts them. Because Jesus does not need a visa to go to any country. Amen. Jesus does not need a visa. 
And so if you cannot go, pray. Commit your Muslim friend into God's care. And Jesus will do the work. I was at a conference in Syria before all the trouble started. And we're talking about Muslim countries becoming, uh, co- getting to know, the, accept the gospel. And they were talking about North Africa. VC was talking about North Africa, about Algeria, and how the Berber people group are becoming, Muslim, are becoming Christian in, in increasing numbers. And they gave testimonies, and they showed the statistics and pictures of Berbers becoming Christian. And there was one American lady there who just burst into tears. And then she got up and she confessed. She said, I am so touched to hear this. She said, my church in the United States committed to pray for Muslim, for Muslim, for the Berbers for about two decades. And we've prayed every single Sunday for the Berbers. And so for her to come and sit there and to hear these stories, it was just amazing because she doesn't even know where Algeria is. But she's been praying for the Berbers of Algeria for more than two decades in her church. Prayer works. Amen. Amen. Prayer works. Especially African prayers. Amen. Amen. I, I, went, I went to Fuller to give a lecture and I met African students, a lot of African students there. They heard I was coming. They came to meet me, and we had a meal together, and we were excited talking. I was encouraging them in their studies. And then they were saying, Dr. Zuma, you have to come to Fuller. We need you in Fuller. Why don't you consider coming to Fuller? And I'm like, I've got a job. I'm happy in my institution. Why do I have? And they said, no, no, but we need you here. We are going to pray for you. <laughs> See, and my, my white friend sitting next to me, and I laughed. I said, okay, that's good. You can pray. And he warned me. He said, when an African said they will pray for you, if you don't like it, you better start deflecting the prayer. <laughs> he said, because African prayers work. <laughs> so please, we have a powerful weapon in our prayers. Let's use it for the Muslim world and God will do the rest. God bless you all. Amen. Amen.